God is good, amen? Do you love him today? I love him. I just love Jesus, y'all. I love him. And I love that he loves me. <laughs> he didn't, I didn't do anything to deserve his love. I didn't do anything to earn his love. But he just loves me. What, Romans 5 eight says, when I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. When I was running and in my, in my sin and had my back turned on God, he died for me. He showed me his love in that moment. He's not waiting for you to get it all together. He loves you right now. And his love will change you if you'll let it. Amen? Amen. I think we're done. I think you guys are awesome. Thank you. If you keep playing, I'll just keep going. And uh, listen, I told you we're going to praise for a long time. And we're going to hear the word. And uh, I feel like we need to hear the word. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit and the word are not in battle with each other for the prominence in the service? Do you understand that? (laughs) Like, we don't have to choose, well, do we worship a long time and just not do the word? No, we're going to do both. Because we need to hear the word of the Lord. Amen? And the word of the Lord changes us. Like, being in his presence, that that changes us. But then the word seals something within us. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, I told you a couple weeks ago, and I'll tell you again, I'll try to be quick. I will try to be quick. I can see a clock right there. It says 1145. I see it. That means that we just went an hour. Oh, we went an hour. When we get to heaven, a million years are going to pass in the blink of an eye. We're going to go, what? That was a million years? He's just getting us ready. Remember in Amazing Grace where there's that line, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. No less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. No less, like, it'll just pass in a blink of an eye. Amen? Oh, man. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Man, let me get this iPad right, then we'll get into it. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus, we bless you. We thank you for your word today. Would you put your hand over your heart? Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for what you're doing in this room. I thank you again that where your spirit is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Lord, I thank you that you're changing us, that we're moving from one level of glory to another, that we're being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. What a joy this is. What a joy this is to become more like Jesus. Oh, we love it. We love it. We love spending time with you, and we love opening our hearts and our ears to hear your word. Holy Spirit, anoint me. Holy Spirit, anoint your people. Help us to hear exactly what you want to speak in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 We've been talking about family, and I, I feel like it's just good to come today and talk about family because what we're experiencing just in this moment. Man, that's just the Father loving on us. Do you understand that? Like that that is the Father opening his arms wide and just going, I love my children. I love to spend time with my children. I love it when they respond to me. I love it. That's his heart. Do you understand that the fire hydrant of God's love is always on full blast? It is. His love is always on full blast. The question is, are you positioned to where you can receive it? That ties into something that Blake, Blake always talks about that vulnerability thing, doesn't he? Every time he gets up here, he talks about vulnerability, and it's good. It's good. I'm glad the toughest looking dude in the room is up here talking about vulnerability. Uh, No offense to anybody else, but that's a tough looking dude. That mustache, like, you know, like doesn't have a neck because his traps are so big. Like... That's the dude up here talking about vulnerability. If it's me, you might ignore it. But the big guy's up here saying, let's be vulnerable before the Lord. And I just love it. And it's actually the fulfillment of a prophetic word that we got one time when our buddy uh, Todd Mosley was here. And he brought a friend with him. And, and that friend said, someday I saw this big looking dude, this huge guy. And he was back in the sound booth. And he came up to the front. And he just started pouring out his heart to God. And he said, I feel like when that moment happens, your church is just going to move into revival. And, and the last few weeks as I've seen Blake come up here, I've thought, 
There was a time where every Sunday, Blake was the dude back in that sound booth. And that guy didn't know that, by the way, when he said that. He didn't know that. And now, that, that was kind of Blake's safe space, too. He could kind of worship up there, and he got free up there. And then he just wanted to be up at the front. I'm telling Blake's testimony for a minute. Are you mad at me? He can beat me up, so I don't want to make him mad. <laughs> But I feel like the Lord, that, like, that's a fulfillment of God's promise to see Blake up here free. Because I can remember a time about five years ago where he would have been about three rows from the back. And during a service like this, he would have stood there kind of like this, thinking, I hope this part's almost over. <laughs> Am I lying, Blake? I'm not, telling, I'm not saying anything he wouldn't say right now. But the Lord's done a work in his life. And I, I, believe, I believe as we learn to respond to the Father's love, it changes us. And, and that's, that's part of what we're doing in this family series is we're saying, hey, we're part of a spiritual family. And I know that the healthier that our earthly families get, the healthier this spiritual family is going to be. Yeah, yeah. And I know that family is a tough topic to talk about because a lot of us come from brokenness in families, right. me included. A lot of us, our greatest hurt is when we look at family. And when we hear somebody up here talking about family, all it does is remind us of how we've fallen short. Let me tell you something. That's not the voice of God. That's the voice of the accuser. He loves to condemn. That's not what this is about. This isn't about me coming into the room and saying, oh, your, your family's so jacked up and you've blown it. That's not what this is about. But I do want to challenge us. I do, I do want to say, here's God's standard, and let's not try to lower our experience and get God's standard lower because our experience doesn't match up. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's what a lot of people want to do right now, is we want to say, well, I can't measure up to God's standard, so let me pull it down. Yeah, I, yeah. That's true. You guys are like, James, can we go back to the encouraging part? <laughs> this is encouraging too. Yeah. This is encouraging too. We can't pull this standard down. We see his standard, and we thank him for it, and we go, God, I want to live up to that. Amen? I want to live into your holiness. I want to allow your love to call me into your holiness. Ho holiness is not, <sighs> holiness is so joyful. Right. Holiness is so awesome when you get a hold of it. When, you, when a person really gets a heart of holiness, they never have to do something. They get to do it. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? There is no sacrifice when you get a heart for holiness. And the Holy Spirit touches you and goes, I want you to lay that down. And you go, really, Lord? Okay. Awesome. I love to lay it down. I believe the holiest people in the world are actually the happiest. And if you've encountered people that say they're holy, but they're really grumpy, and they're constantly calling out people's sin and, and pointing out what's wrong in people, that's not holiness. That's called a pharisaical spirit, and Jesus hates that. Listen, I'm all for, like, if it's sin, we're going to call it sin, but we're going to do it with a smile on our face and a tear in our eye. You, you ever been around those people that they kind of get off on calling out sin? Like, that's not the heart of Jesus. It's just not... I'm trying to talk about family, guys. I really want to. So we're going to close out our, our series on family today because God's all about family. And if we strengthen our individual families in this room, it's going to strengthen our church family. Our church family is going to be stronger. And I want us to understand, I said this a couple weeks ago, but I believe that it's so true. Healthy families don't happen by accident. Healthy families happen by choice. Healthy families happen by choice. Your family e is either healthy or unhealthy based on the choices that you're making. Now you're saying, hold up, James. You said you weren't going to beat me up. It really does come down to our choices. Yeah. <laughs> Joshua 24 verse 15 says this, if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Did you see that little word that Joshua used? He says, choose today whom you will serve. The Lord never said, I'm going to force you to serve me. The Lord never said, I'm going to force your family to be right and act right. He said, you have to choose. Listen, moms and dads, you make the choice. You set the tone with the decision you make. You choose to prioritize God. You choose to make the things of God the highest priority in your home. And then at some point, your kids are going to have to make that choice for themselves. Right? And 
I just want to set a parent free in this room today. Some of you have had children that have gone astray. Let me tell you something. So did your heavenly father. He's had about a billion of them. Well, there's what? Seven billion people on the earth today. They say there's two billion that are Christians probably. So the Lord's got five billion kids that have all gone astray. Don't be beat up if you got two or three that are not following Jesus. He's got a lot. And you know what? The pain he feels, the pain you feel, multiply that in his heart times infinity. <laughs> but the Lord, the Lord gives us the option to choose him. Amen? Because there can't be love without a choice. Right? We all understand this. If I, if I take out a gun and I point it at somebody and I say, say you love me. It is weird. I'm sorry. Everybody's like, don't go back to open door. That pastor is a psychopath. Hypothetically, if I hold a gun to somebody and I say, you say you love me. And if they say it, Nobody's going to go, that person really loves James, right? Because it was coerced. It was forced. God isn't looking for robots. He's not looking for, you know, puppies that will just fall into line, you know? Like, you ever had a puppy that just follows you everywhere you go and just loves you, you know? Like, that, that's awesome. But God wants more than that from us. And that's why he created us in his image. And that's part of, listen, when you read that proverb that says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and in the end he won't depart from it. You know, we haven't been taught how to interpret the Bible. There's a difference. Do you understand that Proverbs is a completely different type of, of literature than the rest of the Bible? It's, I'm not saying that there aren't promises in Proverbs, but that is, it's called wisdom literature. It's, it's saying that most of the time, this will turn out true. If you do this, most of the time, this is what happens. Okay? And so sometimes people will look at a promise like that and they'll go, well, I trained my kids. They were in church. We did family devotions. We read the Bible together. Like, I did all that I knew to do. And they still strayed. Well, keep believing that the seeds you planted will come back. Because it says, in the end. And if there's still breath in their lung, then it's not the end yet. Amen? And choose to say, God, I believe that I did my part the best that I could. And move forward. I'm not even supposed to be saying that. But it just feels good to say this. In this hour, I want to talk about some do's and don'ts of parenting. In this hour, we need mothers and fathers who know how to call their families into serving the Lord. And it doesn't happen by accident. It happens through intentional parenting. And also, I want to say, I do believe, I do believe that God wants to do something in the times that we're living in where we're going to see in some churches, I don't know if it's going to be every church, I don't know how this is going to work, but I do believe believe that that there's going to be an in gathering the closer that we get to Jesus's return Jesus said he said I'm going to gather up the wheat and the tares they're all going to be brought in together and I believe that there's going to be an in gathering before Jesus returns and that means there's going to be a lot of new baby Christians that are going to need spiritual moms and dads in their lives to help train them up into the kingdom I remember the greatest thing that happened to my mom and dad and, and the two people that played a huge role in my mom and dad's salvation are in this room, Barbara Allen and, and uh, Deborah, right there. Because they were witnessing to my dad when he was a dadgum pagan in the beauty salon. They were witnessing to him. And, and do, you know, do you know how my mom and dad came to the Lord? This is so crazy. And I'm not saying that God caused this. I'm saying that God works he takes evil and he turns it around for good. You know how my mom and dad came to the Lord for real? You know what was the thing that pushed them into Jesus? My three-year-old cousin came out of the swimming pool, grabbed his mom and dad's keys, stuck it in an electrical socket and died. And that broke their heart. And instead of running away from God, it pushed them into God. And because there had been two women that had been pouring into my dad, they knew where to go. And they got saved 
And then we went over to Bobby and Debbie's house. I remember three or four times a week, it seemed like, as a kid, doing Bible studies because my mom and dad, they didn't know up from down. They didn't know anything really about the Lord. I don't think I'm over-exaggerating that. But their Bobby and Debbie helped play a role and had us come over every night, taught my mom and dad how to get in the Word How to read the Bible. It wasn't a church program that did it. It was two believers that knew how to be a spiritual mom and dad. You are called to be a spiritual mom and dad. And that's a problem that we have in the church right now. I feel the anointing to get on you for a minute. But that's a problem that we have in the church right now. Is you think it's the Sunday school teacher's job to raise everybody up. And God needs all of us. In the times that we're going into. He's going to need all of us to be able to raise newborn Christians up into Jesus together. And I'm thankful that we have the church, and I'm thankful that we have Sunday school teachers, and I'm thankful for the role that I get to play. But do you know, do you know how to disciple somebody? Do you know how to sit down with somebody and just open up the Bible and say, here's how we read the Bible together. Here's how we pray. Here's how we start growing in the things of God. Do you know how to do that for somebody else? If you don't know how to do that, I need you to learn how to do that. Because I'm going to need spiritual moms and dads in this house to raise up people when they get saved and get free. Help me, Lord. I'm not even anywhere close to these notes. I feel like this is a good thing to say. I'm just, this is going to be all over the place. Somebody needs to hear this, too. As we get into do's and don'ts of parenting, let's hit a disclaimer. Because I've seen this a lot. We all understand that there comes a point in your child's development where your primary role is no longer parent, you become a friend, right? The problem I see used to, I think the problem used to be parents never made that transition. They just kept staying parents. They couldn't hand their kids the keys of the car and be like, okay, go. You know, like I'm just here for moral support now. They kept wanting to mother hen, you know, their 25-year-old, their 30-year-old. Stop it. Like, that's a grown man. That's a grown woman. Let them fall on their face and be there to help them pick up the pieces. Okay? And, and I feel like there used to be a generation that they, they just couldn't let their kids go. But now I see part of the problem, too, is, like, we want to start being our kids' friends when they're, like, four years old. Your child does not need you to be their friend when they're four, when they're 10, when they're 11, when they're 15. When they're 17. They don't need you to be their friend. They need you to be mom. They need you to be dad. (laughs) And there will come a time, you know, there will come a time where you hand the keys over and you say, okay. But listen, until I left my dad's house, I knew. I knew who was dad. (laughs) I knew what was up. (laughs) All right? And that's, that was a good thing for me. You, do you understand? You're anointed to be a mother. You're anointed to be a father. Don't hand that anointing off to be friend. Like, be their parent. That's what they need. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's for somebody. I don't know who, but just keep doing it, you know. And ask for wisdom to know when to hand the keys over. I think the Bible gives us some tools for effectively parenting our kids. Let's read a couple scriptures because we need to read from the Bible. Proverbs 22, verse 6. I I mentioned this. Train up a child in the way he should go. Train up. That's important. Train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he's old, he won't depart from it. In the end, he won't depart. And then Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Listen to what this says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Do you understand what discipleship is, like on the ground level, discipleship is you teaching somebody how to obey the word of Jesus. Does that make sense? Like that's what it is. Mom and dad, do you understand that you have, it's such a short window, man. My oldest girl's about to be 11. She's like turning into preteen. And I'm going, Lord Jesus, I'm not ready for this. Like, you know, I just feel like so out 
gunned, you know, sometimes. Like, oh, man. And then she's got... My kids are 23 months apart, man. We went from no kids to three kids in 23 months. And so I got the other two girls that are, I mean, hot on Grace's trail. Okay? And, And the older they get, every passing year, I realize, man, what I thought... What I thought would be just this long length of time, man, it's going by in the blink of an eye. I have this small window in which I get to be the person discipling them. Mom and dad, that's what you're doing. You, have be, you are called. You are the chief discipler in your mom and dad's life. Not the kids pastor, not the youth leader, not the Sunday school teacher, you. You are the one that will have the most influence in your kid's life, Right? And, and this window is so short that we have to make a difference, to make an impact in their lives. And do you see what we're calling them to learn? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Mom and dad, one of the first things you have to teach your kids to do is obey you. Like, that's not wrong. That's right. I see so many kids that their mom and dad didn't teach them how to obey them. So guess what? When they get to school, they don't obey teachers. When they go to a workplace, they don't listen to supervisors because they've never been taught to obey. Why do we think our society is breaking down? Because we have a whole generation of people that their mom and dad wanted to be their friend their whole life and never taught them how to obey. Like that's a problem. And this is our first, like, this is our first role for our kids, teaching our kids to obey. And I know I've got aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas in this room. Come alongside your parents. Come alongside your kids that are parenting now. My parents have been pretty good, pretty good. Most of the time, when I say, no, we're not going to do that, they're right there with me. There's been a couple instances, not my mom. She's in the room. She, she doesn't do this. But somebody else, my dad. Um, <laughs> You know, I'll say, I don't think that's a great idea. Oh, I'm still getting her an iPad for her ninth birthday. You know, like, what do you do? Do you understand how much pressure that is that your kid just opened up a gift and it's an iPad and you're going, I don't want her to have that yet. Come alongside mom and dad. If you're grandma and grandpa, don't fight against them, back them up because they need to learn how to obey. Okay, for this is right. Honor your father and mother because this is the first commandment with promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Like there's a promise that your kids will get to inherit by you training them to obey you. Like you are, you're not the bad guy because you try to make your kids obey. You're actually a really good parent because you're helping them step into full and lasting life. Man, that's awesome. This is like, a good double whammy. They listen to you and they get the blessing of the Lord on their life. What is wrong with what the Bible's teaching right here? I can't see anything wrong with it. I think it's pretty good. Then it may go well with you and you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I want to give you three don'ts, three do's, okay? Do's and don'ts of parenting. And I'm going to hit these quickly. And I hope to kind of bring them into kind of the spiritual aspect too. Don't provoke your children to anger. First, don't. Don't provoke your children to anger. This is echoed in Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. There is a fine line that we have to play with our kids, that we have to walk with our kids. We have to know when they need to be built up and we have to know when it's time to knock them down a notch. Right? Like, there's, there's just every once in a while, about every, my, my kids are pretty good, but I can tell there, there comes a time when their attitudes start to kind of shift, and they start getting a little lippy with mama, yeah. and I've just accepted my role. Like, Holly d- tries, but I'm the disciplinarian in the house, all right? And I think that's part of what dads, you know, like, it just comes more naturally to dads. I think there's some moms that it comes more naturally to them. I, I know that's not all the time, but I think a lot of the times it's the dad. He just, he does that. He comes in. It's time for an adjustment, you know? <laughs> it, <laughs> the iron fist of love is coming down. <laughs> I didn't think about that as I was saying it. 
just standing here with a clenched fist talking about discipline of my kids. Take this off Facebook immediately. But there's a line that we have to learn how to walk, and it's this. If all we do is beat our kids up, if all we ever do is point out what's wrong and we never stop and say, man, you're doing this really right, then they're going to become discouraged. And, and the same goes with spiritual parenting. I've seen so many people get discouraged as they begin their walk in the Lord because well-meaning Christians come alongside them and just start treating them like they need to be 100 years down the road following Jesus. Well, they're a week old in the Lord. Let's encourage them, and then along the way, we're going to start saying, hey, you know, maybe we need to start shifting the way we talk about this. Maybe we need to start shifting how we spend money. You know, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of times, we try to hammer it all at once. I can't treat my 11-year-old like she's 21. Right. That's not fair to her. Right. It will discourage her. Yeah. I'm going to treat her like she's an 11-year-old. And also, I believe this commandment extends to both parents. Because here's the deal. Here's what we're called to do as parents. Hopefully, we have more power and more maturity because we're further along down the road. Yeah. Now, I've met some, some parents that that might be questionable. Yeah. <laughs> I've met some parents, their 10-year-old acts a little more mature than mom and dad do. Huh? Yeah. You ever been around it? Hey, come on. Yeah. I'm just saying, it's not, it can happen, right? Yeah. But hopefully, as a parent... You're, you've got maturity, you've got strength, and what you're doing is you're using your maturity and your strength to call your kids to a higher place. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Second thing that we don't want to do, don't show favoritism to your children. Don't do that. There have been all kinds of studies that have been done. Not only does this mess up the kids that aren't being favored, but it messes up the one that gets favored. Like, it's just so much pressure. If you are the kid that's favored, you have this pressure on you. Like, if I fail, I'm going to blow up for mom and dad. Like, you live with this pressure. Don't do that. Why? Because in God, he, God doesn't play favorites. The word of God says he's no respecter of persons. Amen. I mean, I love to say, I've even heard Barbara say it, so if Barbara says it, then it has to be true. Yeah. I'm his favorite. <laughs> Come on, Barbara, you know it. I've heard Barbara, I'm his favorite. But she doesn't say that neglecting you or excluding you. I say it too. I know I'm my father's favorite. I know how he looks at me. I know what he speaks over my life. I am his favorite. And the good news is, so are you. So are you, and every single one of your children, man, they should feel like they're your favorite kid. Like when they get alone, they should kind of think, you know, I'm mom and dad's favorite. <laughs> every single one of them. But when it's real favoritism, it messes them up. But when, there's, when it's real, true, equal treatment where each one of them know that they're loved and their, their purposes are being called out in unique ways, man, that's amazing. Don't do that. Third, don't. And we've hit this every week. Don't lead a life of sin before your children. Four amens. It's okay. I understand. Four amens. We're like, okay, James, don't lead a life of sin. How are you doing? Not great. I was reminded this week. I was reminded this week that there's a lot of things, as we're teaching our children, there's a lot of things that are more caught than they are taught. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I can say, hey, watch your tone. Don't raise your voice. When you get angry, don't act a certain way. But when they see me, I've got a cat that's got a demon from hell living inside of it. I, I know it. <laughs> I know it, y'all. I walked in the house the other day. Holly had brought, it was, that cold snap was about to break off. And Holly had brought all the plants and the flowers that we had just bought. And she brought them in. They're sitting on the windowsill. And I just happened to walk in as that cat had just knocked one of those planters over. Like a big three-foot-long planter just knocked it over there. And you know how after cats knock something over, they stand there and look at it? <laughs> I walk in on him doing that. And I see the mess and I see him looking over it. And... <laughs> How dad says, when you get mad, don't act. I acted that way. You, I, I won't say. It wasn't cuss words that I called the cat, but they weren't good words that I called the cat. And I grabbed that sucker, and 
I was th- like, in my mind, I'm thinking there's a white fence that runs along the outside of my back door. I thought, I'm going to take this cat and I'm just going to throw it at that fence as hard as I possibly can. But because the girls were watching, I got to the door. Cat people are hating me right now. I got to the door and I didn't squeeze it hard or anything like that. And I just gently dropped it out the door. But <sighs> there, there are things that are... There are certain things that are caught, though. So I can say, hey, when you get mad, don't blow up. And then I watch them. It's my turn to watch YouTube. It's my turn to have the tablet, you know. And they're screaming at each other. And the Holy Spirit goes, hey, James, remember how you acted with the cat? Your kids are just catching how you just acted. They're acting just like you. (sighs) Holy Spirit, why you got to do me like that? You know, you ever feel that way? Like, Lord, right now. And you can't really even be mad at your kids. You got to discipline them. You got to say, hey, this is where a couple weeks ago I told you, I I apologize to my kids. This is where I had to come back and say, you know, dad lost his cool. Shouldn't have treated the cat like that. Whatever. (laughs) You know, you try to be legit because I want to train them up in the way they should go. But, But here's the thing. If we're saying one thing but doing a totally different thing, they're going to catch what we do, not what we say. They're going to hone in how we, you know. We can say, hey, don't talk disrespectful. But then when you start throwing snide comments at your spouse, where do you think your kids learn how to throw backhanded things at at their brother and sister? Ooh, nobody's laughing now, huh? Just tickled Peyton pink. <laughs> and, and, and then, dads, every week I've, I've been here, I've kind of come at you. I want to come at you again. Dads, you better be careful what you're looking at. I've talked to more than one young lady whose heart was broken when she caught her dad looking at stuff on the Internet he shouldn't have been. It's going to be real hard to teach purity when you have that compromise in your life. Don't lead a life of sin before your kids. And I'm not, I'm not just preaching that. I've talked to more than one girl that that left a scar on their heart. Yeah. Be careful. So those are the don'ts. Don't provoke your children to anger. Don't show favoritism. Don't lead a life of sin. Here's three do's. Do love your children. Love your kids. Be attentive to them. For goodness sake, when they're talking to you, put the stone down can't tell you how heartbreaking it is to me sitting in a restaurant and, and a, a kid's talking to their mom and dad and mom and dad won't even stop looking at the phone. What are you, what are you like practically telling your kids if you can't just put it down while they're talking to you, man? Okay. Okay, I'm trying to be nice. Show them affection. Show them affection. Um, th- there's some research that's been done. Child Trends and nonprofit research organization studies have shown that higher self-esteem, better parent-child communication, and fewer psychological and behavior problems have been linked to warmth and affection being there between a child and a parent. Yeah. Now, I understand not everybody's huggers, not everybody's love language is physical touch, but your kids probably need it. So for the sake of your kids, sometimes you just got to suck it up and go, hey, I'm not a hugger, but you know what? Maybe my kid needs a hug. You know? Like, just do it. Um, I mean, there's been a, a couple of people, a couple of, you know, the older guys from the older generation, they just didn't say, I love you. And that did something to their kids. And I think if they would have known how much just, like, you don't have to say it every five minutes, but, like, maybe every day at the end of the day, just say, I love you how much of a difference that could have made in their kid's life? Like if they would have known that there was like a hole in their kid's heart because they couldn't say three words, I think they'd go back and they'd do that. You know? Okay. Show genuine praise. And here's what I mean by that. Your kid doesn't need participation trophies for everything they do. Good grief. Like, oh, you went to the bathroom. Good job. No, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay? Like, maybe at the beginning, but if they're five and you're like, hey, you did it, you know. (laughs) Listen, I know there's special circumstances and maybe there needs to be encouragement there, so don't. But 
Let me slow my roll there. But there are certain things where you show genuine affection. You show genuine praise. You're like, hey, this, you did awesome. Make sure that you're, you're uh, showing them praise when they've achieved something, when they've done something out of the ordinary. Show them. Tell them. There's been a couple times, you know, if we'll go three or four days in a row and the girls have gotten ready and they haven't fought with each other and we're in the ride to school and it's peaceful, I'll just say, girls, these last few days, you guys have done so great getting ready. Thank you for not fighting with each other. Thanks for listening to mom and getting ready. Yeah. You know what that does? Next day we have the breakdown. But <laughs> does it ever feel that way? Like you show them praise and the next day they're like, well, we're doing good, so we better be bad again. Yeah. <laughs> but you show them the praise anyway. You know, you build them up anyway. Hey, eat meals together. This is a way you can show your kids love. And this is a way, like, as spiritual parents, you know, we all act like we're so busy. You, you're going to eat three meals a day, probably. You can't go eat breakfast, lunch, or dinner with somebody. Like, spend time. Quality, uninterrupted family time will show your kids that you love them. Do discipline your kids. It's the second do. Do discipline them. They need it. They need it. Listen, why, why do your kids need discipline? Why do your kids need that? Because God is a God of order. And your kids need order in their life. Now listen, if you don't have order and you're disciplining your kids but they don't know what the rules are, shame on you. That's not fair to you. And I know I'm not supposed to put shame on people. But listen to me. Don't discipline your kids if they, they're not clear on what you expect from them if you've never said hey hold on I don't like how you're talking right now you know if you've never said hey I, I need you to pick up your room every day if you haven't told them what you expect from them and then you just blow up at them and you discipline them without them even knowing what they've done wrong you are not doing it right as a parent have boundaries tell them what they what you expect and then when they don't meet those expectations that's where discipline comes in all right and finally do train your children in god's ways proverbs 22 6 train up a child um that word train can be translated dedicate or train and i want us to understand that there's a difference between teaching and training teaching means that you're providing knowledge you're giving them instruction. You're giving information. And there's a time where your kids need information. But there's also a time where they need practical hands-on. Here's how we do things. And that's what training is. Training means developing abilities through practice with instruction or supervision. Mom and dad, come alongside your kids and open up the word of God with them and say, this is how we read our Bible. Mom and dad, come alongside your kids during a prayer time, this is how we spend time with God in prayer. This is how we hear God's voice. Teach them and show them how to do these things. Mom and dad, remember one of the big reasons. We, we could have our kids out of worship during Sunday mornings. We could do that. A lot of churches do, and I'm not condemning them. We could do that. But I think there's something powerful about moms and dads modeling worship to their kids. That your kids are watching you. And that you get to set the tone. This is powerful for them. And that's why I want them in the room while we're worshiping the Lord. Model corporate worship to them. Amen? Amen. Train your kids in God's ways. So the do's. Do love your children. Do discipline your children. And do train your children in God's ways. And, and then give it to God. And then give it to God. Do your part and then give it to God. Because here's what, here's what I promise you. He actually loves your kid way more than you do. He does. He does. Okay? And you can trust him. He's good. Okay? 